If you've spent even the smallest amount of time on the channel, you probably already know that I am a huge Shadow the Hedgehog fan. We don't just bleed blue here at Ace Card Gaming, there's a lot of black and red stuff in there too. Should probably see a doctor about that. And you're probably already wondering to yourself, but Mark, you already gushed over this guy for 20 minutes in his very own video. Not to mention the Team Dark analysis. What else could you possibly have to say about him? Ho oh, ho don't you worry your pretty little head, my friend. I have plenty left to say about our friendly neighborhood space hog. With Shadow's existence these days being sporadic, disheartening, lacking in substance, I figured it might be nice to go back to the very beginning and talk a bit about the origin and early concepts for this brave, noble, manly chest-haired creature, both in terms of his character and his design. And I also figured, what better way to do that than to ask our special guest, YouTube's resident Sonic Concepts expert, Eldarin, to lend a helping hand. Hey Mark, thanks so much for having me on. It really means a lot, and your channel is amazing. I heard we were talking about the development of Shadow in this video. I've wrangled the beast that is Shadow and Rouge's development on my own channel in the past, so being able to help out with this is my pleasure. And Sonic Adventure 2 is like my favorite game, well, ever. So count me in. It's great to have you here, man. And with that, I think we're more than equipped to tackle the origins of Shadow the Hedgehog. But before we jump in, just a friendly reminder that subscribing and liking videos really helps the channel. Those simple clicks go a long way and are seriously appreciated. There is plenty of Sonic and gaming content on the channel, so hopefully I can make it worth your while. Anyway, let's get into it. While I think it's safe to say we all know Shadow made his grand debut back in Sonic Adventure 2, according to Takashi Iizuka, the idea for Shadow was actually being discussed as far back as development of the original Sonic Adventure, as the team were eager to further emphasize their focus on deeper storytelling in the inevitable sequel. And what better way to do this than to create yet another character to rival Sonic? Yeah, that's right, another friggin' rival. The concept of rivals and evil doppelgangers isn't exactly a new concept in the Sonic series. I mean, if anything, Sonic Adventure was a standout in the mainline series after Sonic 2, with no new character introduced in the game with the sole purpose of rivaling Sonic. Unless you count 3D Blast? But I don't know, what with that game being fully developed by Traveler's Tales? I'd personally call it a spin-off. But for the sake of argument, the camera. The camera can be Sonic's rival for that game. CD introduced Metal, and Sonic 3 gave us Knuckles, but Metal was busy locked away in Eggman's love dungeon on the Egg Carrier, and Knuckles and Sonic are now BFFs, so Shadow was created to be the swanky new Dark Mirror counterpart for Sonic, this game's big bad, with the intention of Sonic Team at that time being that he would only ever do so in this one game. And the fact that Shadow was revived from his tragic death through his sheer popularity with the fans just goes to show how important he is to so many people. Oh yeah, he was, and still is, loved by fans of the series to this day. It's funny you mention about Shadow being revived from his death in Sonic Adventure 2. As contrary to popular belief that he was revived because of fan outcry, in an interview with IGN prior to Shadow the Hedgehog the game's release, Takashi Izuka admitted he always had plans to bring Shadow back, and have him star in his own game, since, well, his inception. And during that same time of development for Shadow the Hedgehog, Yuji Naka said that they had received loads of letters from kids asking for Sonic to have a gun. They of course felt it would be inappropriate for Sonic himself to be holding a gun, but they decided to try it with Shadow. <laughs> I know I'm in the minority here, but I actually do love the gunplay of Shadow, but that's a whole different discussion. Anyways, it's so crazy to me that the team knew they had a fantastic character on their hands right from the get-go, and I'm sure that had to be a great feeling of satisfaction from his creators, seeing everyone praise and welcome him into the cast as one of the greats of the series. Yeah, but this is the guy who also said that the damage to the moon caused by the Eclipse Cannon in Sonic Adventure 2 was still there, even though the moon appears perfectly intact in subsequent games, but that we were always just looking at the other side of the moon. Which is impossible, as the moon's rotation is synchronized with Earth, and as a result we are always looking at the same side of it, leaving it to the fans to try and cobble together any sense from his statement. And, you know, his flawed reasoning on Sonic's hyperform, an assertion that the combined Sonic 3 and Knuckles isn't canon, just makes me wonder how fickle his thinking can sometimes be. 
and when it comes to hyping games or answering Q&As, I kinda get the impression Azuka mostly just wings it. And it's always good to make it look like something awesome was the plan all along, am I right? Now look, don't get me wrong, I love Azuka, but sometimes what he says can seem a bit flaky. And whether Shadow's resurrection was planned all along or not, I don't think the fans would have been too happy if he was gone for good. Shadow's character spoke to a lot of us in ways that not very many other characters in the series ever have, and it's strange to think that he could have easily been missing from games like Sonic Heroes, or that we may have never gotten to see his tremendous growth in 06. Or, you know, his spin-off game. Anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself here. This magnificence is the end result. It took a lot of conceptual work to get to this point, so let's take a look at the strange and wonderful conceptual journey it took to get here. From conception, the central theme for Sonic Adventure 2 was the duality of good and evil. On the surface, its two teams completely contrast each other in their morality and what drives them to achieve their goals. Yet, they also resemble each other in terms of their gameplay and special abilities. Paradoxically, the game holds up a mirror to both sides, and what is reflected back is the exact same image, but somehow also completely different. Even the game's logo conforms to this ideology, with the poster boys for each side of this conflict intertwined to form a single image in a yin-yang effect. With the game's direction now firmly decided, Sonic Team now had to create a Dark Sonic character to pit against the crowd favourite Little Boy Blue. And with the mechanical well of silver, mecha and metal pretty much tapped out at this stage, it was time to try something new. A living, breathing, free-thinking doppelganger that would push Sonic to his absolute limits in a fight to save the planet. Under the direction of Azuka, Kazuyuki Hoshino and Yuji Uakawa began drawing up a lot of conceptual designs for Shadow. Or as he was known at that early stage, Terios. No, not the SUV. Terios was apparently chosen as a derivative of the Japanese word terasu, which can mean to compare or illuminate. I always love stuff like this, because even though the name wasn't chosen in the end, it still had significant meaning for the character, as compare was probably to tie in with his similarities to Sign, and illuminate ties well into Shadow's final name, as there can be no shadow without light. Also, I found Shadow's redemption and big reveal as a totally wholesome dude very illuminating. Tied that together nicely. I've always found Shadow's name one of those that is very simple yet incredibly effective, even in the English language, as Shadow has multiple meanings itself, with partial darkness casted onto an object from a ray of light, or reflected image, which in the story of the game, both fit the character perfectly, as Shadow serves as the dark counterpart to Sonic the whole game, but still has that side of him that is good, which can be interpreted as those rays of light, being the true good in him from his promise to Maria or his misguided sense of what he feels is right, and obviously, a reflected image being in reference to Sonic. It's really great to see just how much care was put into every aspect of Shadow's character during his origin, and with that, it's very easy to see why he was such a smash hit among fans. Agreed. The reason Shadow worked so well as a character was because of the level of care and attention put into every aspect of his design, including his name. The first piece of concept art nearly looks more like an echidna than a hedgehog, with its slicked down quills looking a lot more like Knuckles' dreadlocks than Sonic Spikes. But he does have the series patented Hedgehog Cyclops eye, and the ears are definitely similar to those of Sonic or Amy. But personally, when looking at this weird hedgehidna hybrid, apart from the random Xbox Live headset, I'm drawn to his weird mechanical looking, bug-like eyes. Kinda reminds me of one of the Metal Sonic prototypes from Sonic Adventure 1 actually, and while I do think this design is really cool, it's definitely the furthest from Shadow's final design by a long shot. I agree, it's super cool. I found these interpretations of Shadow, or I suppose you can call him Terios here, but that's besides the point. Focusing on his eyes in this, they've always reminded me of the security helmet from the Halo series for some reason, but in this piece, I definitely think they leaned in more with the science fiction alien aesthetic more than anything with those eyes and head resembling what you'd see a cliché alien look like. I don't think this kind of design would have fit the character nearly as well as his final, though. Next, we have the ultimate fringe form, Emo the Edgehog, where Shadow basically looks like an emo kid in the mid-2000s, fresh from a shopping spree at Hot Topic, complete with a metal bangle, not totally unlike something Cloud Strife might wear, but I'm more of an inhibitor ring man myself. While he is still rocking the Echidna-style dreads, you can see the Hedgehog design starting to slowly creep in a bit more, with Sonic's adventure-style smirk now plastered on his smug face. Ah uh, yes. I'll pull from what I've previously called this piece, the 
I didn't comb my hair today design. This piece would have definitely not fit the character, and I do find it interesting how this looks more like a replica of Sonic than anything. It's really cool seeing how these different ideas of having a dark Sonic would end up evolving into its final product. The art direction seems to steer decisively towards Shadow the Scarface at some point, with some heavy inspiration from the Lion King, I guess? I kid, of course. Bad guys with scars on their eyes are nothing new, and inspirations for this design could have came from anywhere. I especially like the one here with the cool shoulder cloak, and very regal looking gloves and boots. This design actually wouldn't have been out of place for him for his appearance in Black Knight. But after the final design we ended up with, and the setting Sonic Adventure 2 took place in, as far as that game is concerned, it's hard to imagine any of these designs being as successful as his final one. You know, that is a really good point about Black Knight. This design would have fit perfectly in its setting, having Shadow or Lancelot have this more rough and seasoned style, befitting of a true knight of course. I would love to see these different designs get translated to 3D as unlockables one day, if the adventure games were ever remade. How cool would that be? 100% agree. If Sonic's movie boosts can be in colors, I don't see any reason these designs couldn't be added as skins in any potential remake of Sonic Adventure 2. Or, you know, I can be greedy and ask for a Mega Collection style compilation of the adventure titles, complete with all this amazing behind the scenes stuff in the museum section. Hint hint Sega. But in the meantime, Shadow the Muscular Butler anyone? These four designs were revealed by Sega at a Sonic 25th anniversary event hosted in their Joyopolis Park in Tokyo. And I think it's really cool how even at the early stages of his design, the colour scheme for Shadow is already very much established. Yeah, his markings and quills are nowhere near final yet, but the focus on black, red and yellow is there, and the white belly, which later evolves into Shadow's patented furry tuft, is also now present. It looks like they may have tampered with the idea of giving him a Metal Sonic style eye, with the red irises and black pupils on this guy giving off some serious metal vibes. It's hard to say if this means Shadow was at some stage planned to be a robot, before we uh, were all told he might be one. Foreshadowing. Or maybe it was just an experiment. The scarred eyes still persist in some of these designs too, and I really get the impression that at some stage during Shadow's development, the artists were very fixated on having him missing an eye. And this brings up some cool comparisons in my mind, with Big Boss and Solid Snake from the Metal Gear series where Solid Snake was a more recent and morally intact version of Big Boss, aka Sonic, and Big Boss coming from further back in the timeline, a once decent guy who turns to the dark side after the many things that happened to him and the people he cared about, or Shadow. And the two possess many of the same skills and abilities. And hey, I could just be talking shit here and reading way too far into things. It's not like I'm known for that or anything, but I really enjoy drawing comparisons like this in gaming. I'm wondering if one creator I like might actually be inspired by another, which would be really cool. I also found it really cool how by this point in the character's development, they settled on a color scheme that would stay all the way till his final. All these designs showed off in this compilation featured the same color scheme of black, red, yellow, and white. While you may think this set of colors was decided upon just because it looked cool, this scheme does have meaning behind it, with black, the base color for Shadow's fur, generally being symbolic of mystery, power, and sophistication, which 100% describes Shadow throughout SA2's story. Red, which is symbolic of courage and anger among other things, that is reflective of Shadow's involvement with the story, of having the courage to right the wrongs he's committed, falsely seeking vengeance against humanity in the name for Maria. Anger, which is translated to his burning hatred for humanity due to Maria's death. The color yellow, which generally represents hope, which in the story of the game, much like Shadow being a beacon of hope, as he's able to bring happiness to humanity, fulfilling Maria's last wish of bringing hope to the people of Earth. And finally, White, which represents purity or innocence, and in terms of the story, which I believe also embodies Shadow's character as displayed throughout SA2, he did not have true hatred in his heart, as he saved Rouge, and by the end of the game, well, the planet itself. But as previously mentioned, just a misguided sense of anger being led down the wrong path of vengeance. It's really cool seeing how what can be considered just a cool design or color palette end up intentionally embodying the character and their core values, being worn right on his sleeve. And just on the note of those awesome colors, as well as Shadow's markings, which were actually inspired by Kabuki makeup, and his quills, which always seem to be slicked down in these designs, as opposed to the final slightly elevated style, that always makes me think of Supersonic, like Shadow's power is always bubbling at the surface. Another one of his prime features that I have seen no sign of anywhere in these conceptual designs is his air shoes, 
Which makes you wonder, at what stage in his design process did they materialise? And while I suppose any of these could be hiding the jets somewhere underneath, there are certainly no obvious indicators like we see in the final design, making me think that they were probably added much later in development. Which is weird, because I could not imagine Shadow without them. I found all of these designs really interesting though, and it just goes to show what a strange journey a character can go on before their final designs are ever decided. Sonic Team wanted a Dark Sonic for their story. One who was just as cool as the real deal, no less. And with the final design for the character now set in stone, it was up to the game's writer, Shiro Meikawa, to bring this vision to life and create this Dark Hedgehog's personality and motivations. Shadow's story arc in Sonic Adventure 2, Revenge Turn Redemption, is one that's very well known among Sonic fans. This story, and the character of Shadow the Hedgehog, resonated with so many people that his death in the final moments of the game had to be unwritten. Such was the outcry from fans. Now, I didn't know much about Shiro Meikawa before making this video. I knew he was the writer of Sonic Adventure 2, and that alone was always enough for me to know he's a very talented guy. But when I thought more about the popularity of Shadow, and asked myself what is it about this guy that makes him so special to the fans, I just had to look into it further. And the answer I came up with is Shiro Meikawa. This guy put every ounce of himself into making Shadow the fantastic character we all know and love. His creative process was just astounding, and the heavy responsibility of having to create a brand new character as cool as, or even cooler than, Sonic the Hedgehog was not lost on him. He even dropped things on his friggin' head to try and jolt his brain so as to get into the mindsets of the characters he was writing, and spent drives home from work and many late nights planning out conversations between these characters and creating storyboards for the game, all by himself. I could spend another 50 minutes here doting about how great Mayakawa is, and how dedicated he was to the characters and stories of this series, but I think this sums it up perfectly. When making the storyboards of Sonic Adventure 2, he taught himself scripting and how to draw just for these storyboards, so he would be able to fully illustrate what he was thinking. That is some serious dedication right there. He also was asked in that Sonic Channel interview, what was his favorite scene of Sonic Adventure 2, and his influences when making the story of SA2. And his response was that there is a scene in which Shadow and Maria view the Earth from the space colony, but in this scene, the influence of one of my top three mangas, Please Save My Earth, appears hugely. If you aren't familiar with the manga like myself, in short, Please Save My Earth is about several students having mystic dreams from a previous life on the moon, in which they begin to uncover the secrets to what they have forgotten. It seemed this had a huge impact on the way the story played out in SA2. The first indicator being a habitable moon. There's a lot more connections with that manga, but I don't want to spoil the manga if you haven't read it before. What is even more crazy about this connection is the manga was adapted into a Japanese anime in 1993, and the voice actor that voices the main heroine of the show is actually the same voice actor that voiced Maria. Meikawa says it best here. Actually, it turned out that the voice actress, Yuri Shiratori, of the heroine role of Please Save My Earth, was also in charge of Maria's voice, and I felt that it seems like a destiny. I'd love to see him come back, as he's been very open on Twitter about wanting to return to write Sonic. Maybe one day. I'd love nothing more than to see that happen. The guy is a dedicated and talented writer, and it was him at the helm writing these characters when they were at their best. When he recounts the time he first came up at the scene, before Sonic and Shadow fight for the first time, aka the Faker scene, he says this was the first time the character truly spoke to him, and he heard Shadow's voice play out in his head, which apparently shaped a lot of his character traits there and then. And when asked who his favourite character in the series was, Meikawa responded that it had to be Shadow, and as one of his creators, he actually often preferred Shadow to many of his real life relatives. The dude's love for the character is plain as day for all to see, and while he was clearly under a lot of stress coming up with all the ideas, he still somehow comes off as a super chill dude, and it's no wonder Shadow turned out so awesome. Some of the interviews with this guy are amazing, and if you want to check them out in more detail, I'll be leaving links in the description below, so check them out if you get a chance. But Shadow's origin, his reason for existing, was always suspiciously missing from his debut. Sure, he's the ultimate life form, created aboard the Space Colony Ark by Eggman's grandfather Gerald Robotnik as part of Project Shadow, a study into immortality. Most of this had to be explained in future games, like Shadow's own spin-off title. 
But even then, Gerald's reasons for taking on the project, and in turn the reason Shadow ever met Maria, the person who fuels his actions throughout the entire game, were never explained. But Mayakawa's vision for the birth of the ultimate life form did actually make it out into the world, hidden away in a Japanese strategy guide for the game. It says Shadow was created as part of Gerald's efforts to unlock the secrets of immortality, and that he was desperate for this project to be a success, as he needed a cure for his granddaughter Maria, who was suffering from a terrible disease known as NIDS, or Neuroimmune Deficiency Syndrome, leading to the creation of the flawed abomination the Bio-Lizard, and the total success, Shadow the Hedgehog, who would set all of the events of Sonic Adventure 2 in motion. All references to this were obviously removed from the game, probably due to the controversial nature of the topic and its similarities to the real-life illness AIDS. The Nid story was however used in the Archie comic series, with both Maria and Bun's Rabbit suffering from the disease, but in Sonic Adventure 2, it was scrubbed from the plot entirely. Mayakawa actually references deleted scenes from the game in his interview with Sonic Channel, saying that he was so upset about the removal of certain scenes that if God gave him an option to give up one of his arms to have those scenes feature in the game, he would have gladly done so. And I wonder if Maria's illness was included in that list of cut scenes. Hmm, maybe in that SA2 remake if that ever happens, huh? Man, are we just teasing ourselves at this stage? Bah, two guys can dream, right? Either way, you just can't argue with the dedication of this guy. And the more I read about him, the more Sonic Adventure 2 makes sense. A truly amazing game, made by truly passionate people. Mayakawa loved his characters as much as we do, and it shows. He went from being responsible for subsystems in Adventure 1 to the writer of the sequel. That's some seriously impressive stuff, even more so since he totally nailed it. Mayakawa was writer for the game series from Sonic Adventure 2 in 2001 up to Black Knight in 2009. And as someone who has said the departure of Naka is likely a big reason the quality in the series has declined, I would now add Mayakawa to that without question, especially when it comes to Shadow. All that was left now was to decide who would give Shadow a voice. And by personal recommendation from Ryan Drummond no less, my hands down favourite Sonic voice actor, Seriously, watch Sonic and Tails Or on MUME's channel. The dude still has it. David Humphrey would get this tremendous honour, and no small amount of credit goes to him for helping bring Shadow the Hedgehog to life. And besides the few short lines during the final Hazard fight, where Drummond had to step in for some of Shadow's lines, he, along with Jason Griffith, can proudly stand among the small group of people who can say that they helped shape who Shadow is. It was always so interesting to me, as depending on the game for Shadow, the voice fit perfectly. I always felt Humphrey was able to bring that mysterious otherworldliness to the character that perfectly encapsulated Shadow for SA2, while Griffith's interpretation always felt a tad more confident, in the sense that he had an identity now, and would set out to do good for the world, which can be seen in Shadow's true hero route, 06, and what have you. Two phenomenal castings for a phenomenal character. A Dark Sonic was Shadow's upfront sell in all of Sonic Adventure 2's marketing from the very beginning, with his big public reveal at 2000's E3 laying it on thick with its contrasting terms and phrases. Justice and evil, yin and yang, light and shadow. But we all know this couldn't be further from the truth, and the remarkable journey Shadow went on in this game, and many of the ones that followed, tells the story of a true hero. Better yet, a relatable hero. One with an impeccable sense of justice. It's actually quite funny that you mentioned the E3 reveal, as prior to that reveal, they had Shadow under heavy lock and key. Shadow was actually originally leaked by the toy company Resaurus, where he was leaked and name dropped in a press release for a new wave of Sonic Adventure figures, before his official announcement of course. These figures never did see the light of day unfortunately, but let me tell you, it didn't end well for Resaurus, as they would conveniently go bankrupt shutting down not too far afterwards. It seems I got myself on a tangent about the merch, but anyways, back to that E3 trailer. Well, if we take a quick look here, Sonic is on Skyrail, which is, well, not his final stage. And that stage's music definitely has the more upbeat rock approach of the rest of Sonic's stages, compared to the more club rock infusion of Shadow's other stages. There's a lot of theories about what exactly happened through the development process, but it seemed that Shadow was originally not going to be playable till later in development. Which makes sense as the original E3 trailer only advertised Sonic, Knuckles, and Eggman as playable characters. The team continually added new characters to the mix throughout development, 
as Rouge would then be added to counterbalance Knuckles, and heck, even Tails wasn't going to be playable in the game originally until Fan Outcry. So I definitely think it's plausible that they decided to add Shadow to the playable roster as to counterbalance Sonic after the inclusion of Rouge and Tails. It would also make sense why he has the least amount of stages, two of them being quite short in Sky Rail and White Jungle, although I do love these stages, don't get me wrong. They probably didn't have a lot of time before release to make more levels for him. Oh man, I love White Jungle. Makes my top three stages in that game easy. But in a game about good and evil, with many clear-cut examples of both, Shadow's moral ambiguity was very much deliberate, and he was created in this way so that the audience could decide on his virtue for themselves. Is he completely good? Is he totally bad? Or is he neither? And ultimately, I think this was what the creators were trying to convey in Shadow's spin-off titles, with its branching morality system, where the player got to choose his path and decisions. But Mayakawa makes it crystal clear what Shadow's canon morality is in 06, with Shadow finally learning to put his past behind him, joining Gun to fight alongside his friends and protect the world. Shadow is a loyal friend to the end, a truly wholesome guy, just like the person who wrote him best. When asked if he had a chance to rewrite Sonic Adventure 2 or change anything about it, Mayakawa said he would only add the scenes he had to cut, certifying him in my book as a true legend, one who can stand by his original vision, something I hope Sega does with Shadow going forward. I'd like to thank Eldarin for his help with this video. It's been a genuine pleasure working with you again, my friend, and I've had a blast tag-teaming this with you. Thanks so much for having me on, Mark. It really does mean a lot. Shadow is one of my all-time favorite characters in the series, and moments like the final scene of SA2 still make 20-year-old me tear up, just because of how big of an impact one singular character was able to leave on the viewer throughout the story. And this is coming from someone who hasn't touched this game since 2005. He's really just that well-written, in my opinion. There was just so much nuance to this character that made him so popular in my eyes. Anyways, it was a pleasure to be able to work on this with you, Mark, and I hope you all have a wonderful day or night wherever you're watching this. And with that, I'll see you guys later. Be sure to check out Eldarin's channel. He makes a lot of cool Sonic content, covering game reviews, concept art, and even the awesome music throughout the series. A link to his channel will be in the description, so don't forget to pay him a visit. If you enjoy this type of content and want to see more like this from me, please make sure to like, subscribe, and do things to that bell icon to be notified when I release more. This really helps the channel, and all of your support is seriously appreciated. Anyway, a big thank you for watching, and as always guys, take care.